Hello and welcome to Streamers and Punches, the podcast from Sound Notion TV that looks at current events and new releases in the world of film music. My name is Bill Witham. And I'm Kevin Wilt. And on today's episode, we interviewed John Ottman, which is awesome because his new movie is not even out yet in theaters. It's X-Men Days of Future Past, and it'll be out on May 23rd. Uh, but before we interview John, uh, we do have a couple of really cool headlines to go over and some things about uh, what Kevin and I have been listening to this last week or so. So uh, let's jump right in. Um, first of all, Kevin, you found this real cool thing about some Star Trek uh, concert tours. Are they going to play the whole movie live with orchestral accompaniment? Um, yeah, I think so. Uh, yeah, you know, I posted these things on this Good talk. Doc so long ago. Yeah, I'm, I'm so prepared. Um, yeah, and I believe they're doing both movies. Um, so certain places they're going to show the 2009 movie with the score. Other places they're going to show the Star Trek Into Darkness with the score. Um, so we'll have uh, – I've got the article on cinemablend.com, and we'll put it up on our, on our Streamers and Punches website, um, and you can find all the specifics instead of waiting for me to comb through them. Um, there's also, so that, and you know, that's something we've talked about quite a bit, this idea of playing scores live to film. And it's, we're always excited when it happens. I think it's an interesting way of hearing a film score, um, kind of as it's meant to be in its perhaps, you know, best iteration, cause it's not being completely overwhelmed by sound effects and all that kind of stuff. Um, another concert that's coming up aside from these Star Trek live concerts, uh, the Pacific Symphony is doing, this is kind of interesting, they're doing an entire concert of music by film composers, but none of it is film music. Um, and actually, yeah, this happened just a couple of days ago. Um, so there are some reviews and things that popped up as well. Yep. Um, so they did music by John Williams, James Horner, Elliot Goldenthal, and Howard Shore. Uh, but again, none of it was film cues. These were all concert pieces. So... Again, I think that's kind of a neat thing. We've there's a we talked maybe a couple months ago about um, a similar concert in Los Angeles. It was all piano music. Some of it world premiere, some of it older music, all written by film composers. So I mean, that was at I think UCLA. This one's at the Pacific Symphony. I guess you know Southern California is the place we expect to hear those things. But I think it's still cool that people are putting on those kinds of concerts. I wish I could go to them, but. Nonetheless. Yeah. Uh, you just chalk that up to um, career development at your division or you your go. department and see if they'll flip the bill for that. Um, Michael Dana, a composer for Life of Pi and various other small films, uh, received the Richard Kirk Award. Uh, let's see. When was that given out? It was recently. I think it was just a day or two ago. It was at the BMI uh, Awards. Okay. And well, if you're a member of BMI, did, were you nominated for any BMI Awards? No. No, okay. You've won a BMI award though, right? Yeah, once. Yeah. You know, back in back in my misspent youth, I won one. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and according to the article that we have linked to our site, it's not a, it's not for any particular film. It's just that they feel that he's made a a valuable contribution to the field, and they've awarded him the Richard Kirk Award. So very cool job, Michael Dana. Congratulations. Yeah. That's nice. Um, on the even more soundbite side of things. Uh, Michael Giacchino will score Jurassic World. So let's see. John Williams did the first one. John Williams did the second one. Don Davis did the third one. And now Michael Giacchino is doing this one. Mm -hmm. All right. I just wanted to run over the checklist. That's it. Yeah. Okay. I'm wondering if go. he has something like, you know, in his contract or with his agent that he has to score like any movie shot in the jungles of Hawaii. Because, I mean, he scored all of Lost, and it was all kind of in the same place. I don't know. Yeah. Well, he did, He did. I believe, the way that Giacchino got in with Spielberg was that he was doing, like, Call of Duty video games. And then they had asked him to do... Uh, he did the Lost World video game. Yeah. So he kind of... Oh, right, right. Like, they said, do Call of Duty like you're, like it's a John Williams score for a World War II video game. I think that's how that worked. And then, then that score was heard, and then Spielberg's like, let's get that guy to do the Jurassic park lost world video game which he did and then all of a sudden he started doing more video games and then uh went into tv shows yeah. and then movies and now here he is um and he has said um what when, once they announced this kevin did he deny some rumors well no i was before we go on <laughs> that i was gonna say they announced a couple of days ago that he was gonna be scoring jurassic world and um he he has said that 
I think kind of like Don Davis, he's going to be including or paying homage to some of the John Williams Jurassic Park music. Um, so, yeah. But speaking okay. of, like you were just saying, speaking of Michael Giacchino and John Williams, um, Michael Giacchino has shot down some rumors. I'm not exactly sure why these rumors were popping up, but there were rumors going around that he was going to be um, hired to to help John Williams with Star Wars. I, I don't. Yeah, I vaguely why. saw something about that. Um, because they announced a long time ago that John Williams was going to be scoring it, and Michael Giacchino has come out and said, um, you know, John Williams doesn't need help scoring a Star Wars movie, and I think he's 100 percent right about that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, uh, I have a feeling the whole Michael Giacchino, J.J. Abrams thing, I, it, you know, I almost think that that, that kind of rumor, it's, it's not going to go away until that score is in the can. And it's, I think yeah. it's just one of those things that people aren't going to drop, you know. Well, not to just keep having more news items with Michael Giacchino about franchises that start with the word star, but on that note, uh, they announced this week that there'd be a, a new director uh, who's actually for Star Trek Three, who's actually one of the writers for the previous two Star Treks. Uh, Robert Orkai, I believe, is how you pronounce his last name. I, I believe it's pluralized oh. Stars Trek. <laughs> <laughs> I was that, I was just about to say I believe it's actually Roberto Orkai. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the date when you said yeah, I believe it's, I thought you were going to correct me on the first name, but anyway. Regardless, moving on. Uh, so he will most likely get Giacchino, would be my guess, to sort of I would, consistently, I would think. Yeah. To consistently keep the Star Trek, uh, the new Star Trek cinematic world um, uh, consistent from one, two, and to part three. So there's no official announcement that I've seen, but look out because it will probably be there. Mm -hmm. uh, now, speaking of cool movies being scored, um, a, a good one comes out this weekend and that is godzilla well i don't know if it's good i'm got plans on seeing it this weekend it seems kevin, like it's good people, kevin. people are saying nice things about it I'm, I'm gonna go see it at some point yeah okay okay uh it'll be big so i do have plans on imax 3d just because i i want this to i want it to be huge so i think it will be but alexander desplat uh create uh composed the score and a uh, good friend of the show conrad pope did help, uh, I believe, orchestrate and conduct, or no, I believe Desplat. I yeah, I don't think he conducted, but he was the orchestrator on it. Okay, and he's been posting a lot lately on Facebook about the updates. But yeah, he posted and, a and, really cool video. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and I was gonna say, just for those of you who <coughs> are, whether you are not, your your friends with Conrad on Facebook. He's actually a great guy to follow because he writes a lot of interesting things about film music and. That the things that he has been saying about the Godzilla score are kind of the things that make me want to see the film the most because he's been really talking about how great an experience it was recording that score and they have like full antiphonal brass sections which just sounds really cool. Um, so I'm kind of excited for it for for that reason. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and in, without giving too much away from the video, Despla does speak about the size of the orchestra, the size of the brass section, and how they wanted to match the size of the scope of the movie and also literally the size of Godzilla and to reflect that in the orchestra, which I thought was kind of awesome. Uh, but anyway, so it's a, it's a great little short and then kind of a companion uh, uh, YouTube movie to that is um, a little short that I found recently from composer Kevin Kiner. And you may know him. I actually... I believe I remember seeing his name back on the Superboy TV show back in the late 80s. Of course, that dates me. But um, but now, most recently, fans know his name because he's been doing Star Wars, the Clone Wars, um, and then the new Star Wars Rebels. Both are the, the sort of CGI Lucas uh, – Lu Lucas not Lucasfilm. Lu it's not Lucas – LucasArts TV show, whatever. Um, anyway – uh, so he's got a really cool short where he talks about now because of the timeline, uh, I believe he's saying it's closer to episode four. So he wants to right. actually incorporate more themes from the the familiar themes of John Williams. But um, uh, Kevin, you want to comment on how his music has been so far for Clone Wars or do yeah, you want to save it for a little later? It, it, no, it, it's kind of interesting. And like you said, it's and, and forgiving. Forgive me, you know for my my nerdiness here the the clone wars show that you mentioned takes place 
I think before episode three. So between two yes. and three. And then this new show that starts in, I think it's the fall, um, takes place between three and four. So this is the stuff that's happening before we meet Luke Skywalker. And so, yeah, he said that um, in, in, even in the video, I think he mentions that for the Clone Wars, um, George Lucas kind of encouraged him to stay away from the John Williams music a bit. And and he does. There are moments um, he, he uses kind of his own version of the Star Wars fanfare as the opening credits. And there are sometimes on certain episodes when he um, hints at some interesting things. Like every once in a while, you'll I'm not giving away any spoilers, I, I wouldn't imagine. But um, you'll see the guy who becomes the emperor and you get a little bit of the emperor music from Return of the Jedi or... Um, Anakin, who turns into Darth Vader, does something a little sinister and you get a little bit of the, you know, the Imperial March. And so he he kind of nods to the the film scores in appropriate places, but not overly so. Um, it sounds like with this new series, maybe it will be more of that kind of thing, maybe more of direct um, connection to to the film score. So I'm 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 interested. Uh, I'm interested to hear it. Well, so you mentioned that you um, – we'll just kind of just move right into stuff we've been listening to. Sure. So um, uh, anything else you want to say about Clone Wars? Um, I don't think I – don't, I don't think so. It, it's, it's interesting because like you said, it's, you know, it's just – it's this animated kid show. Uh, but they clearly spent some money on the music. You know, he's yeah. – it's, it's live orchestra and it's, it's well done. Um, it's interesting. Every once in a while you'll get a cue that is, you know, a lot of – electric guitars or a lot of drums or something like that, that really, really separates it from the, the John Williams source material, but not, not <laughs> in kind of a disturbing way. It, it all kind of fits and flows and it's, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. Well, what else have you been watching? Um, you know, I've been listening to the, uh, the Alexander Desplat Godzilla score that was just released two days ago. And, um, the other the other show I've been watching a bit as it's been coming out this season is uh, Hannibal on NBC, which features music by a composer named Brian Reitzel. It's the show is it's really good. It's 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 a really really messed up show. It's and as a lot of people have said about that show, um, it's it's kind of amazing that it's on network television because yeah, I've heard that it is is incredibly graphic and and. Um, it's not that it's super violent. You just see the end result of a lot of violence in, in lots and lots of graphic detail, which is, I mean, it, it's a really great show, but the, the score is really kind of atmospheric and it, you know, I, I, I can't say that there have been moments in the score that have stuck out for me. Um, but sometimes, you know, that, that's kind of the, the classic thing to say about scores is if you notice them then they're probably doing something wrong. Um, so nothing has really jumped out about the score for that show, but I think that's because it's, it works well. Okay. What about you, Bill? What have you been listening to? Um, you know, I'm always talking about the new uh, CDs coming out to buy or, or soundtrack releases. So I, I picked up a few. Um, I can't remember if I mentioned this in the last episode, but uh, I did get the Meteor Man, which is a, sort of a, a mostly black cast superhero movie from the 90s where Robert Townsend stars as this guy who, like, gets superpowers. But Cliff Eidelman, who scored Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, and uh, one of the C Chris Columbus movies back then, um, he scored it, and it's it's kind of nice. You can definitely hear, like, temp, like, Back to the Future and the original Star Wars, and you can hear a little <laughs> temp influence in it, but it's got a really catchy main tune and and it's um, it's kind of like wow it reminds you of like how different movie scores were just 20 years ago um just a, lo a lot more fully realized it's you know got texture orchestration counterpoint and lots of cool compositional devices even when it's kind of ripping off of some other music um it's still got a uh, some nice uh, uh unique characteristic like motives and sort of things that identify it so it's nice it's enjoyable um and I got, I'm such a Goldsmith fan, so uh, I'd never seen the Dennis the Menace movie, and I was kind of like, it doesn't matter. I'm going to get the score. <laughs> uh, 
So, uh, you know, I have just blind love for Jerry Goldsmith's music. Um, it's it's entertaining and it's it's cute. It's it's scored very much in a kind of cartoon music fashion. Um, yeah. I want to listen to it a little bit more. It doesn't really stand out too much um, to other Goldsmith things. But anyway, sorry. You, it's, it, you know, it's been a really I remember seeing that movie when it came out. And it, it's been a really long time since I've seen that movie. But the little bit that I can remember about the score that score was really in that heyday of like early nineties kids movies, like right around that Mrs. Doubtfire kind of went. So everything is like home alone. Yeah. So everything is like very bright and lots of clock and <laughs> and flute solos and lots of Lydian mode. Yes. Lots of Lydian mode. Everything is that raised bright kind of sound. And I remember <laughs> that score being kind of one of those. That's like, would you like some F sharp with that C major? Why, yes, <laughs> yes, I would. Yes. Anyway, um, well, so it, it's it's uh, it's kind of nice. It's kind of charming. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, of course, the Star Wars. You, yeah, you. Uh, that the same time you had asked me if I was going to watch Clone Wars. Yeah. Um, every time I go to Netflix now, it says, "Hey, do you know what's available? The Clone Wars." And then it says like exclusively on Netflix, and I'm kind of like, "Well, okay, I have to check this out." So I did, and. I remember my first impression was like, why did they put like like jungle drumming loops behind the Star Wars theme when it first comes on the screen? Yeah. But I have to say, like, after why did they put it in five four? But whatever. Oh wait, is it in five? Yeah. It's it's, uh, it's like stretched. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. Well, I know. I I like. Well, see, I like it. I mean, because yeah. it it the harmony. I, I loved that you could like watch Bill play it in his head there for a second. <laughs> it's like, oh yeah. yeah. I remember that it's now. Yeah, it was like you could fo- you could follow the bouncing ball in his eyes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, it's uh, it's uh, to me it's um a, a, a one possible way of kind of slightly putting your own touch on something, but yet having it be still clearly recognizable, like the instrumentation yeah. and the harmony. The harmonies are like totally intact, and right. to me, that's what gives it like. The way that they make uh, – I'm going to be geeky for just a second. But when they have the horns and the trumpets play the tune at the opening and then they have the cadence of the bum, 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 and they land on that at the end, that's like the main point now because they don't have enough time to get through the whole theme. Right. So he kind of lets it build and then that triplet cadence at the end is it because as soon as that sounds, then it flips right over and you get the narrator who's basically like – Catching you up with like a uh, you know 1940s newsreel style uh, right. of the action from the most previous episode of Clone Wars. Anyway, yeah, watching the show is a little bit like staring at my neighbor who's outside walking on the sidewalk, and then he stops and he does a 180, and then he walks back on the sidewalk, and then stops and does a 180 and walks back. It's just like Where every episode. This, Bill? Every episode is like they're just running in place. I mean, they go to a different place, they meet new people. But nothing's going to happen in any of these characters because we all know what's going to happen. They're just already seen the next movie. Yeah, yeah, they're just all kind of like walking in place, and then like for a change of scene, and they turn around and walk the other way. But it's it's unless um, I don't know yet what's going to happen to Ashoka, the little the little Padawan or whatever. But I'm pretty sure Anakin's character is not a Jedi Knight yet, right? He's just he's or he's not a Jedi Master. So why? I I think you're paying closer attention than I am. Why does he get to have a uh, Padawan if he's not yet all the way on the top level? So I'm just saying. Wasn't that a have... thing that they that they spent a lot of time arguing about in one of the early in, in one of the the scenes in the in the new trilogy? It was I, I remember some discussion of this with the with the Jedi Council. They well, uh, Obi Wan says he'll train Anakin, and they say that uh, you're you're just now becoming. Or wait. You you haven't no, think, yet. Yeah, you're right. You haven't yet uh, left the Padawan status, Obi Wan, and so and then and then they have like some you know conference about it, and they're like, okay, fine, we'll let you do it. We'll let you train Anakin. So okay, maybe there's precedent set for that. But anyway, it is what it is. But it it is enjoyable, and I do I do find it entertaining, and I like the music. And uh, from the very first episode, uh, Kevin Kiner used the Yoda's theme. And I thought he would be using familiar music in every single episode, and he hasn't. He's been using quite a bit of uh, Star Wars-like music and then yeah. incorporated with more <laughs> percussion and more 
uh, yeah, like rock rock band uh, instrumentation. So very cool, very cool. And then I'll finish up real quick with uh, I saw Amazing Spider-Man Two with the score by Hans Zimmer. Well, if you read the album, it says the um, the Magnificent Six. So there's a list of um, let's yeah, you get all sorts of collaborators on this thing, right? Oh yeah, well. <laughs> I had a couple of pet theories about that, which is that what do you do if you keep scoring all the superhero movie tent poles out there? What are you going to do on your next superhero movie? You all, you're going to be out of ideas is what you're going to be. So you're I, think, gonna... I think each superhero gets their own interval. Batman <laughs> gets the minor third. Superman gets the perfect fifth. I'm not sure what Spider-Man gets because I haven't seen the movie yet. But um, well, there's I, a, He gets there's... something dumb like a minor sixth. <laughs> he would. Um, yeah, like Pharrell Williams and uh, uh, Johnny Marr and Alicia Keys, they're all featured on the score. I mean, at least there's a couple songs where each of them have some input. But there's there's one really cool track that does weave in um, – uh, oh, crap, the actor. Um, Andrew Garfield? Uh, no, the, the one that um, – uh, Jamie – no. Jamie Foxx? Uh, Jamie Foxx, who's the villain, Electro. It does weave in his vocals – in in a, like an electro guitar cue where there's a lot of stuff happening on screen with the villain um, and he's almost whispering in the score. So that was that was kind of cool. It's kind of neat. Um, there is, I mean, it's a rock sensibility. They're like Peter Parker's. He's a cool guy, and Spider Man's like a rock star. So they they approach it that way. So yeah, there's some trumpet music, but um, I remember Kevin and I had a conversation and we thought that sounded like a sampled trumpet, and it might be, but. I listen to it and it's like, well, wait a second. It's it's in the key of E, and that's not the first go-to key you think of for writing for trumpet necessarily. And so, and it's a lot of open fists and force. And so, my thought was, since there's so many rock collaborator musicians that Hans Zimmer worked with, my pet theory is that one of them just figured out the tune on his guitar, because guitars love to play in the key of E, and they like yeah. big intervals. And they were like, hey, let's just try this on trumpet. Because when they do, that's what it sounds like. And then later in the score, you hear it again, but on electric guitar or acoustic, and it totally sounds like it fits. So mm -hmm. that's my theory, is that they just wrote it on guitar and then kind of orchestrated it for trumpet. But um, there's some really cool moments where that theme comes in, and it's big, it's, it's brassy, it's heroic, and it's kind of fun to see, uh, like on the big screen with Spider-Man swinging through the air. The animation is fantastic. There were some great character arcs in the film, um, there were, uh, too many plot lines, but that's the problem now with these summer movies. Um, they're all setting up the next one. So yeah. if that is going to piss you off, then you won't like the movie. But, um, for what I wanted to get out of it, it, it didn't like surprise me, but it was entertaining. So, and the score was, you know, in some parts was pretty cool and, uh, and other parts was undetectable, meaning it was doing its job perfectly well. So anyway, um, there you go. yeah, exactly. Cool. So, John Ottman. Yeah. Yeah. So we interviewed him, and it's awesome. Um, one thing I want to say is that for anybody not familiar with his work, he is most notable for uh, one of his first major collaborations with the director Brian Singer is The Usual Suspects. Fantastic movie. If you've never seen it, it made a career for Kevin Spacey. You gotta check it out. It's awesome. Then he did most most famously X Men Two or X Two. And then uh, there was another one, uh, Apt Pupil, was a oh, drama that they, they did together. Then, of course, Superman Returns, mm -hmm. uh, which is why they did not do the third X-Men together. And you'll hear John refer to that in the interview. They did uh, – Brian Singer made X-Men 1, and then – and John was not available to score or edit the film. John came on board for X2, and they were both going to until they got snatched up to make the new Superman reboot, mm -hmm. which was Superman Returns. Uh, then they also worked on the Tom Cruise movie Valkyrie. And um, then John went on to score some other things like the comic book movie uh, Fantastic Four. And I think he did the sequel. But then he also did Astro Boy, animated film. And then they came back recently and did Jack the Giant Slayer or mm -hmm. Jack the Giant Killer, depending on which source you get the title from. So anyway, it uh, was a lot of fun talking to John. And again, we're really appreciative of the time he was able to spend with us. So... Without further ado, here's our interview with John Ottman. Join me in welcoming John Ottman to our show today. We're really excited to have him because the movie X-Men Days of Future Past, or as I just found out, the short term is 
X Men D O F P is uh, not even out yet in theaters. It's going to be out on May twenty third, and we're really excited to have him here. Uh, welcome to the show, John Ottman. Thanks. Great to be here. Yeah, and um, I wanted to just say whatever this is. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, you turn you on know? Skype, and I don't know what it is. I'm just talking yeah. to these three guys. We don't really know what it is either, so it's okay. It's the future. <laughs> That's it's always the future. Is what it. <laughs> yes. Um, well, uh, just real quick for our viewers, um, just for any uh, not familiar with you, and, and they will be familiar with the movies you've worked on, of course, but um, John's, uh, I, I think his work's unique because he often does tackle dual roles with his films uh, as an editor and as the film composer, but when he attended uh, the USC Film School in Southern California, he went as a filmmaker, not as a film composer, and as he was alluding to a little earlier, that the film composing part of it kind of came in a little bit later, and actually, could you just kind of start talking about that a little bit, John? Well, I was saying, you know, life is like that. You, you end up doing what the thing you least expected to be doing. I was always a film score geek. You know, I listened to film scores and, you know, like and went outside Tower Records and wait for the next Jerry Goldsmith album. And, and never in my yeah. dreams would I ever expect to be doing this as, uh, professionally. But, um, you know, uh, the, the, the short story is I was uh, editing uh, our first feature with Brian, Public Access, and um, I wasn't the composer on it, but the composer dropped out at the, in the 11th hour when we had a Sundance deadline. And I had been doing the composing thing as a hobby um, in the 80s. I, you know, it was 88, I guess, I graduated from SC. I cobbled together all this used equipment and taught myself how to put Simpty Stripe on videotapes, and I started rescoring my friend's student films and so, so forth. Anyway, it was a hobby, and um, I made the case that, hey, you know, A, you're, you're screwed, you have a deadline, and, and I'm on the <laughs> film as the editor, and I know it better than anybody. Buddy. So I so I, I wrote the score, and I think I think that was the first time anyone had done that before, and it got um, noticed for both the um, the score and the editing. And then so when we uh, put Usual Suspects together, I just said, you know, um, I like film scoring. I'm not really. I don't want to go edit the film. He's like, hell no. <laughs> so I always say the blackmail has continued to this day because he won't let me uh, just score the film unless I'm the editor. You know. Well, that was actually something that is in the... Um, I mean, he might if I really had the guts to say, screw you and see what happens. But you know. <laughs> the, the IMDB biography for you does say that you're either contractually obligated or there's <laughs> been, that you were, a promise was made. that Somewhere back I said, okay, I promise I'll edit the films, you know, but... Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> what, God, why? Why did you... I'm you know, um, a man of my word. What... What is that? Because that's that's unique, and no one else we've ever interviewed has has that kind of a, a career description. Yeah. Uh, how much crazier is that in general, or is it just uh, you've just gotten used to it? How can I? See? No, I haven't gotten used <laughs> to it. I mean, uh, first of all, no one does it because they would be insane to to, <laughs> to do this to themselves, and and a it's and also. If you've got a good thing going as a career as a film composer, why would you leave that career and go to editing jail and um, lose tons of scoring gigs? So, I mean, I, there's a little bit of frustration for me uh, about all the, the scores I could be writing that I'm not writing. But, but um, having said that, it's weird. The film scoring as an art form these days... Well, let's put it this way. It, was film, it used to be the, the film composer would walk in as a luminary, would descend from the clouds, and, oh, my God, the composer's walking in the room. It was such a hugely valued art form. And, you know, in the last decade or, or a little bit longer, it's sort of because of garage band and, oh, my neighbor kids writes that. And it's, it's so that the value of it has sort of been reduced to, and a composer just feels, sometimes feels like, sometimes, sometimes feels like you're walking in as, like, no better than some craft service person. And so I guess I get frustrated with that after a while. And um, so being the editor, I'm, you know, Brian, who gives me a lot of authority over the, to, to make a lot of decisions on film, I feel like I'm in control of something. But, um, but, but then again, it's like after about two months of that, I've had it. I'm like, why did I, why did I say yes to this? It's like, because um, it's, it's overwhelming. I mean, obviously the, the, the toughest part for me is when there's the overlap between the scoring and the, managing the film it's not like i just say like okay i'm gonna go write the score now bye put the film on hold we can't do any changes i mean that the, the film's in flux all the time whether it's visual effects whether it's looping actors whether it's recutting um having countless studio screenings um uh just you know a, a myriad of things that, that, that uh, are always going on as i'm trying to, to write the score 
So that's, that's the hardest part for me. And the moment I, the moment we start shooting the film, I'm worried about this thing I got to do, which is to write the score somewhere, somehow. I don't know. And it always seems to happen. How do how do the the two different jobs kind of influence one another? Do you do you think when you're editing a film, for example, do you think about how how you know how is the scene going to play out when you go to score it? Do you uh, does your yeah, brain? Yeah, I mean, kind of I, I'm think thinking about, about we'll it, think- but not specifically. I, 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 you know, it's, I, I'm putting a sequence together, and I know the kind of music it has to have like there has to be music with you know gravitas here or whatever but i don't i I wish i had the time to go to a keyboard write something put it on the scene but but um um frankly i'm 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 one of the few editors i don't know of any other editors i'm sure there are but i don't i don't um cut to music at all um Mm -hmm. which is surprising to people since i'm the composer but um as a filmmaker i feel like um it's often a mistake the the um it helps sell a sequence. I mean, you desperately want when they can walk in the room or if, if during shooting, if the director walks in the room and I'm, I'm, I'm going to unveil the scene I've cut together, it helps to, to put music on because it just, it just um, sells it. Yeah. But I find because everything is, it's all in self-interest. It's all going to blow up in my face later if there's a problem. And the music tends to mask an issue that the scene might have that we're not recognizing right now. And it sort of puts you in denial for a few months, but then few months later, we're going to discover that issue, and again, it's going to explode in my face. So I'd rather um, put the entire film together, and my editor's cut is dry, any music at all. And I feel like if I can sit there and watch a two-hour or two-hour-plus cut and be involved in it, and it's completely dry, then the score is just going to elevate it, and it's not going to depend on it completely. It'll be a stronger movie. And I think that, and that, and all the problems will have been exposed and solved before I um, have to solve them with the music if I can't solve them editorially. You know? If that makes any sense, but yeah. So then I spend about two weeks in the temporary store, um, so I can show the film and sell it to the studio. And this is our, mm-hmm. and this gives them, gives them an idea of the kind of score that's going to be written and so forth. Okay. Do you ever? I guess this is kind of a strange question, but do you or would you ever edit with a metronome? I feel like that's, you know, it, when it, someone is scoring a film, they have to spend a lot of time kind of pacing out a cue and figuring out, okay, what. What is maybe an appropriate tempo and how can I sync things up and make all those adjustments? If you're the editor, it almost gives you kind of a, a shortcut into that process a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I think, I think you know, a really good editor or a good storyteller is, a, I mean, I think a lot of editors are closet composers and, and you have an internal metronome, metronome going. And I know what you're saying, like, but even though it's internal, it can't be, it's not going to be specifically to some click. Right. right. But, uh, but uh, I don't know. I always... Um, I, it's like I got one hat on, and when I go to score, it's like it's like I'm going to make whatever I cut work, and um, I rarely am cut, I'm changing. I'm rarely changing the image to accommodate the music, um, and it all seems to work. I mean, with today's technology, with with scoring, I mean, you can you can you can do fractions of beats and um, and do time stretching and so forth, and, and it's, it's, you have so much less to worry about about things hitting right on. Mm-hmm. Um, I did that one in the old days. I did that to uh, Usual Suspects. I I did one scene to a click because I knew that um, I wanted the music to specifically hit these these moments, but I didn't know what the music was going to be yet. And that's uh, when the the, uh, the jets are landing at JFK. It's this whole taxi heist sequence, and um, and uh, and I just knew I wanted to sort of do these jump cuts with the planes uh, landing. Okay. Um, I had a question now to sort of bring it from the editing stage to the composing. You had mentioned, uh, so you're in film school for films. Um, and again, if the IMDB uh, bio is correct, then it said you uh, you played clarinet. And right. Like, okay. <laughs> so, Basically, it, but I played. <laughs> I, I, played I mean, you know, I played clarinet in a marching band and band in high school. And uh and I used to actually write little ditties on, uh, you know, with pencil and paper. And I remember um, I wrote one composition, and, this, and the teacher flipped out and said, "You have great musical um, something. You have great musical instincts, or something." And then, but you know, years go by, and I, I long forgot how to even write music out with with a pencil and paper. And then, and then uh, with MIDI, you know, it allows you to do it on the keyboard. But um, but I did. I did start there, and then uh, I would. I, I, but basically, the way I learned, aside from knowing how to read music and play it on the clarinet badly, I um, 
I would go watch my favorite symphonies be performed at uh, in San Jose where I grew up. Um, so I was again, I was a geek. All I listened to was film music, and then I went to Tower Records one day, and I asked the guy who worked in the classical section, "Can you give me a bunch of CDs that are that of uh, symphonies that sound like film music?" And so, <laughs> and so I so I got onto Dvorak, New World Symphony, you know, and then and then you know once you got into that, then I get more, then I got more into classical music. Then I would watch them. Um, be performed, and everybody. Oh, that's that's the Charlie doing that. Oh, that's that that's that section doing that. And so I would really learn by watching. Yeah. That's um, I remember when I was younger. That's almost identical um, to my own experience because I remember hearing the planets and thinking that parts of Jupiter sounded like Conan to me, or or like little Star Wars or something. And so right, you'd, right. Go, you'd go backwards and you'd find uh, you'd discover Wagner and Tchaikovsky. You know, by way of the Empire Strikes Back, or oh yeah, yeah. Or, well, then you hear, then you hear like a score you've known forever, and you're like, wait a minute, that's bar talk. I mean, Goldsmith, oh. <laughs> used, a lot, Goldsmith used a lot of bar talk, and and WC, I would hear in, in like moments of Poltergeist and stuff like that. You know, so it's 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 cool to 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 hear the masters at least you know um, being inspired by or ripping off other composers. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. Uh, getting, getting, I, I, I still can't hear. I still can't hear the beginning of the second half of the Rite of Spring without imagining droids in the desert. It just, right. It, I can't separate it anymore. It's it's all right there. And, well, and, you, and you've heard the corn gold piece upon which the Star Wars. Oh theme. yeah. Oh yeah. So. Yeah. No, it's it's yeah. It's so many similarities and and yet, but it. I never felt angry or like I was gypped or anything like that. No, it's almost justified. It's almost legitimate for some reason to for a composer to rip off a classical piece because it's I don't know why. It's um, I don't know what, what the difference is between ripping off that or some other contemporary. But but um, and they would do it back then. They would rip each other off, you know, without even, I don't well, without realizing a lot, which I think is what happens today too. But um, yeah, somehow it's it's sanctioned if it's if you're ripping off some classical piece. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, okay. Well, let's. Uh, flash forward to now um, with the X Men score. Um, I wanted to first ask, well, what can you tell us about the movie? And no, no, not that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, is the theme from X Two uh, gonna make a reappearance? Yes, it made it through. Man, it was a long journey <laughs> to save that thing because um, you know Brian you know, wants to make sure that we, you know we're not dated and that we and that we are uh, you know hip and so forth and i think i think because of superman returns felt very nostalgic that we were caught up in in preserving something that that he was afraid if we use the theme we're going to be caught in that same syndrome again i kept telling him no because because x-men 2 is the most iconic in my opinion and everyone sort of pretty much acknowledges it's the most it's the it's the favorite x-men film and um and and it's and, and i'm a little biased but my theme I think the studio always wanted to use it, but composers never did. And, I, and, I, and, and because I'm on as the composer, I felt like I wanted to at least give some symmetry between X2 and this movie. And so the, it, I, I really pushed to use this theme. And, um, and you know, uh, a good theme is timeless. And, and, it, and by association, it's attached to a good film. 11 years later, it's going gonna, it's gonna to update itself, you know, and um, it's, it's, and not, it's nowhere as iconic as a Star Wars theme, but, but you know, it would be like changing the Star Wars theme 10 years later. I don't think, I don't think Williams is going to go off on some crazy tangent and score the next Star Wars film with a different theme, you know. So, um, so anyway, um, it made it. <laughs> so, yeah. And um, there's actually a funny thing I did on, on X-Men 2. I... I did a little nod to the theme in the 20th Century Fox logo music, and the, the, the orchestra loved it. They were, like, digging it, and um, the executives heard it and freaked out, and the <laughs> memos went, went, went everywhere, and it, the thing got shut down. It was never in the movie. It was on this extended uh, soundtrack release that came out years later. Um, so I tried it again, but this time I put it in the Avid, and sort of got everyone used to it. And um, the, <laughs> the, chair, the chairman of the studio, Emma, she... She dug it right away. You know, I think for her, it's not that she was a big flag waver of this particular theme, but for her, it's a theme that, that is rousing. She desperately wanted something rousing in the film, which is a very dark and dreary future. So I think she's looking for something to pop, you know. Yeah. And so she, was a, a, she became like a, an ally in terms of pushing this theme through. You know? um, I, I don't really want to ask too much about the film because I'm definitely going to go see it. But it does seem from the advertising that – that it's just like you said, just much darker, and because of the uh, dual timeline, you know, much more bleak. And I wondered if that uh, 
it that created more scoring challenges. So is it like you know Lament for Wolverine or X Men Requiem? You know those kind of like <laughs> a titles. Do they sort of run through your mind, or you're like, no, that, that you guys have been fooled by all the trailers, and my job was a lot different than that, or? Well, I mean, uh, maybe a little bit of that. It's, I mean, the the future is dark and dreary, but after the front of the film that basically uh, introduces it. Um, thank God we leave it and get back to and go to the seventies, which is more fun, you know. And um, and um, and that was where the, the bulk of the film is, and, and the bulk of the score was. So so as as, as dark as the movie is, um, it, it's it, it it is and isn't. So um, okay. um, that's probably evading your question, but but um, um, you know, and just the music just had to keep it interesting. That's all, you know. Um, uh, and for me, is for me, you know digging the X-Men universe and being thrilled to be back in, in it, it was fun for me to write a theme for Charles Xavier, who never had a theme in any of the films, because this film... Um, are we frozen? Oh. No, you're fine. Go ahead. No, oh, my, my, my picture's all frozen there. Um, yeah, he never... You know, this film is really about Charles Xavier and about Raven, and it's about him finding the hope that he lost as a character... As, as for, that his character is known for, and, and about trying to save Raven's soul. And so... Um, I finally was able to do a theme for him that's sort of a thread through the film. That was fun for um, me to do. Just, just as long as it's not a circle of fifths to represent his wheel. Stop it. Okay, never mind. All right. <laughs> does, it, does it have double sharps in it? Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, funny. Um, that's enough. Did, were you asked to include any of John Powell's music or Henry Jackman's music? Well, oh, uh, oh, or that's like <laughs> that's divulging secrets. Then uh, <laughs> I wasn't I wasn't asked to use any John Powell's music, and I wasn't I, I wasn't asked to use any music. It's uh, there is a funny one. Well, it wasn't funny for me, but you know, um, basically, I had written the entire score, and I had I had um, alluded to uh, a Magneto theme throughout the film, which was loosely based upon a moment that Magneto has in X Men Two, and um, it's a very simple two note theme usually, so you can basically absorb something um, for him every time because, you know, modern films are cut so are cut more quick. And um, and I had a little review for the studio and uh, Emma, my ally for the theme, was saying, are you going to use uh, Wolf, um, you going to use um, Magneto's theme from X-Men 2? And I'm like, I hadn't planned on it. The score's written. It's like, if you told me this three months ago, I would have been more than happy because I don't have an agenda or ego in that regard. I would have, I would have used it, um, but we didn't, we didn't use it. Um, I, did, I did just to save my ass in case she was watching the final playback of the film that she wanted that suddenly. I did um, an alternate cue uh, in the film, which is a big, the big, his big fruition moment um, where I, I alluded to Jackman's theme. But, and and the, the Jackman theme, though, is actually interesting, talking to a bunch of music scholars here. Um, it's actually the Wolverine theme from X-Men 2. And so for me, it's weird. Um, uh, I can only imagine it's either a complete happenstance or they tempt with X-Men 2 on first class, which I actually know they did. And I think they might have tempted with the Wolverine music from X2, and then he turned it into a big bombastic version of itself. Because if you listen to the score to X-Men 2, when uh, Wolverine walks into the augmentation room, it's, it's, and that's, and then, so it was weird when I watched first class, that's, but it's for Magneto. And like, that makes no sense. It's Wolverine's theme. So, so, um, and, it, and and I didn't use it because it didn't make sense to me. But uh, but I, I basically I, I had decided to uh, to keep consistency with X two and use the, my Magneto theme from that, which I'm sure I'll be slaughtered for by by some fans who love that um, Magneto <laughs> theme from uh, First Class. Well, this, this yeah, really interesting. Haters right. are gonna hate. <laughs> yes, that's, that's right. right. That's right. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> It, it's fascinating that when you have so many films in a franchise with different composers and you start to run into those kind of issues. Um, well, yeah, I mean, the, the frustrating thing is there's just absolutely no consistency in any of these movies. And it's and, um, frustrating for me because we were supposed to, of course, you know, do X-Men 3 after X-Men 2. And so it's like I had, I had written all these, uh, planted all these seeds in the score of X-Men 2 for what was going to happen in X-Men 3. And then when it, we uh, deep-sixed it, 
um, for Superman, I was like, well, crap, where's, where's the score going to go? And of course, another composer comes on, doesn't want to use the theme, and, and it's, then it's a whole different thing. Yeah. And, um, and so it's, I, maybe it's kind of nice to at least now there's at least some symmetry between two of the movies, you know. Yeah. Um, I don't even care if, if I'm coming on as a composer and I haven't written the, the first film or whatever, I, I prefer to use the theme that the other composer's done because, I mean, like Superman, it's like uh, it would be idiotic to use some other theme other than Superman for the, the Superman that we did, you know. So, well, so I, want, you mentioned- I wanted to hear when Spider-Man came out, I wanted to hear the dun 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 in some, <laughs> in some big orchestral version. I was like, why, why is it a new theme? You know, so I'm, I'm really diehard in terms of consistency. So. Well, I'll tell you real quick, if you've seen Amazing Spider-Man 2, uh, no. that does make its way into the film. But oh, not, good. Not maybe in, in an orchestral way, but it does make its way in okay. there. Right. And yeah. it, it was a, it was a gag in one of the Sam Raimi ones, wasn't it? Wasn't there like a it, like a street yeah. violinist that played it or something? I don't know. You know, the oh, weird thing is, like I've never that. been into Spider Man. I never, I've never, see, I seen like half of the first one. I never saw any of the films. You know, it's, I just don't have an interest in Spider Man for some reason. Yeah, that's okay. It's weird. So just now, don't... now, John, you've mentioned you mentioned your work on Superman Returns a couple of times, and. and I'm wondering if we can maybe uh, go to that a little bit because in some ways it is, you know, it's a big superhero franchise, just like X-Men and there's pre-existing material, just like X-Men. I'm wondering if you could talk about that project versus this newer one and how that process was different. Cause it seems like the, the end result anyway was quite different. Uh, the end result of uh, the score of Superman. You're right. Right. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I've told the story before. It's like I, you know, when we started the film, I was, I was, and when I started the scoring process, I was crippled because I, I was getting emails from people, practically death threats, you know, and like, if you don't use a John Williams theme, and also, you know, why are why are you scoring the movie, not John Williams? And so I was just like, you know, so there's so much pressure to do the right thing, and um, and I, again, I told the story. I basically at some point I just had to say, fuck it, I'm just gonna like, I'm gonna. I'm going to make this movie and I'm going to score the film as I would as if I just walked in here and, I, and I'm looking at this movie to write how I would write the score. And, and, you know, and because a lot of my sensibilities are born from John Williams and Jerry Goldsmith and James Warner and the people I grew up with, I mean, I, had to, I already had that sort of scoring sensibility ingrained in me on top of the fact that the Superman score that Williams wrote is basically in my brain. Uh, and I never had to, I never had to, refer to any of the scores from Superman. I just, it just flowed out when I was writing something. And um, so the, anyway, that, that freed me up just to sort of like, try, just to sort of say, I'm going to ignore everyone, I'm going to write the score. And I think actually people were actually surprised um, how many times I did nod to, to uh, Williams' uh, material um, because I just entered it as if, what if, what if that theme, what, what if I had written that theme for this film and I'm going to score the movie now, you know? And so I just did it the way I would score any film where the theme is uh, a well to draw from, you know? Yeah. Um, but, uh, and it's just, like I said, it was effortless. It was, uh, once I got started writing, it's like, um, it just, it just plugged in the dun dun dun, whatever just felt like it made sense. <laughs> so, <laughs> did you have um, any and, discussions with, with the director about what, what, from the original Williams to include, or maybe, because I know certainly with one thing that has been talked about, I think quite a bit is the change in the harmonies, especially for the love theme. And I'm wondering how that, that came hmm. about. Um, again, I, there really was no discussion about it. I just, um, you know, often the way I work with Brian is he, he's, he reacts, he's a reactor. So he wants to be presented something and he'll react to it like an audience member. And, and if he likes it, done if he doesn't like it he'll just say i don't like this i'm not feeling it but he's really he's not really he doesn't specifically go into a project and say i want this and so um uh again i think he was surprised of the size of nod i gave to the lowest lane theme when i when i did it and um and again no referring to scores i just just performed it you know and actually that made it kind of cool because i'm sure by not referring to the scores it I ended up changing orchestrations and so forth that I didn't, I wasn't even aware that was changing just by doing my own, how I would do it, you know? Yeah. Um, I just remember, uh, at the time I, I got some of the, uh, you know, the various, I would read some of the various reviews online or some podcasts and things like that way before we even did ours. And I remember hearing a lot of people kind of heap on, you know, these over expectations about, well, it's the John Williams music 
with this other person handling it. You know, this like. Uh, yeah, I mean, there was like 115 <laughs> minutes of music. That's what really gets me. It's like I nodded the theme quite a bit, but I did write the score. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of stuff in there, you know. Yeah, and and um, I mean, in hindsight, I looked at it like the 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 William, the Superman fanfare and the love theme. They're there to be, uh, you know, uh, plugged in appropriately. Uh, yeah, yeah, and then you had the original material, kind of like the, the more uh, sort of emotional theme for Superman that was uh, emotionally appropriate and was used, you know, quite prominently. And right. and I thought after a couple of listens and a couple of viewings of the movie that that it emerged, you know, in its rightful place. But um, yeah, I just when you were done with that, did you kind of feel like you know I'm glad I'm done with that, or was it really just another movie for you? I'm always, I'm glad I'm done with that. <laughs> but but um, no, you know, I was really super relieved. I remember that when I wrote the score that, it, that all those critics and all those people who were, who were out to kill me embraced it. And um, they, and that was a tall order to, to convert those people. And, and uh, for the large part I did. And um, a lot of people became fans of that score. And um, so I was really, really relieved, you know? Yeah. Well, let's see. Uh, can you tell us what you have going on next? Yeah, a life. Um, <laughs> I, I, a vacation? I, I'm probably the only person in, in Hollywood where when their agent calls, I'm full of dread. And I just, <laughs> and I'm like, what? You know, <laughs> tell me some gig. I'm like, are you kidding me? You know, so I don't know. I don't, I don't have anything planned right now because really, it's, so when I take on this double duty, um, it's, it's sometimes triple duty because I'm essentially – I, Brian's creative producer because I, I, I'm not just a guy at a computer. I'm on the set. I'm storyboarding scenes. I'm I'm uh, designing designing sequences with the previs artists. It just just it goes on and on. And um, I um, uh, what was I going to say? I just um, I'm so burned out that uh, I can't imagine jumping into something right away. You know? Well, let me well, let me go back. Let me announce the sequel. And my legs buckled. So I'm like holy <laughs> crap. You know, so. When you uh, when you've done films where and I'm I'm trying to think maybe maybe Astro Boy was one where you just did the score is that right Yes yeah that's was one of that... my favorites I mean it's with me it's like my favorite works are the ones that no one hears and it's really it's quite upsetting because uh, I <laughs> really uh, Astro Boy is one of my favorites there's a few other favorite things I've done and, and it's always those are the ones that no one hears but um. That was just a fantastic experience. You know, John Powell says this, and I totally get it, where he says if he was relegated to write animated films for the rest of his career, he would die a happy person because um, it's just a fantastic venue for a composer. You can wear your, wear your emotions on your sleeve. Uh, um, the people you work with tend to be happier, well-adjusted people. <laughs> uh, and I just had the greatest time. It's the, it's the only time in my career where... When I wrote a piece of music, I could not wait for the people to come over and hear it. I mean, normally you dread them coming over to hear a cue, um, but I couldn't wait, and it was like a love fest. And um, so it was really upsetting when the thing just tanked and no one heard it. You know. Well, th that's one of the few that, uh, um, or not one of the few so much as I, I when I purchased it. Uh, yeah, I, I have it. I mean, I own it. I have a lot of scores, cool. um, but it's like, yeah, full disclosure, but. Um, I remember I was like reading your little note on the inside of the booklet and you, you mentioned kind of what you just said, how you actually really enjoyed writing it. And I was like, yeah. I, I think he might just be saying that because there's always the drudgery involved in. No, no with me, I'm Mr. Half Glass Empty or Glass Half Empty, believe me. I am not a positive <laughs> person. But um, so <laughs> for me to have said that, it's true. I just couldn't wait to get up in the morning and write for that movie. And um, it, it was a tremendous amount of joy and happiness. Also, It was a joyful film, you know, and just come off of a very difficult experience on Valkyrie, which is a, you know, very dark in a sense of. Uh, Depressing movies. Everyone dies at the end, and yeah. and um, I got a lot of personal <laughs> stuff in that in that amount in, during that project, and so I just came out needing this movie. So it was just um, so it was a it was a great experience for me. Yeah. And well, it, when I hear the score, it sounds to me almost I don't want to say it's therapy, but I thought this yeah. is where all the internet haters jumped all over Superman Returns, and then he writes what is basically like a cartoon young boy version of Superman. It's a kid who flies and who's invincible. Yeah. And the music, I mean, uh, I, I love the score. It's just, it's very colorful. It's very thematic. It's fun and um, great performance on the album. And it's like, 
it it seems like it's completely free of any shackles of it's true i mean it's really it's weird it's like uh, it just like you can hear the you can hear the psychological relief in me you know and uh, it was just yeah yeah so there it is yeah <laughs> so, so you got to do another animated movie uh, I, I would love to you know it's in this town you can write the most brilliant thing in the world doesn't matter if the film made no money it doesn't you know it's like if Astro Boy had been a big hit I'd be doing another animated film now so it's, it's hard to get an animated film based on the fact you did a really good score for a film that no one saw because all they'll care about is no one saw it you know but I'll try okay <laughs> Well, hopefully you you'll get a bump from being on streamers and punches, and uh, yeah. no, right. you, uh-huh. you won't. But we'll we'll try to you know hype it up that way on on Facebook. That's the like bump. That. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, let's see, Kevin, did you have anything else? No, I think that's it. That's it for me. All right, and you okay. told us what you got next, which is some R and R, which sounds fantastic. Yeah. Um, Maybe I can find a relationship I can destroy in the next film. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah. sounds <laughs> healthy. Um, well, John, that was awesome talking to you. Uh, thanks again. And I, thanks for sparing a moment. Cause I know, oh, you know sure. it's fun. Uh, a huge, these summer tent poles get larger every year. And this one's got like the biggest cast I've ever seen in a film. Uh, yeah. just, and the expectations are pretty high. So I'm, yeah, just, I mean, it's like these trail, these no Fox, pressure. Yeah. yeah. Fox is so good with marketing. They really are brilliant at it. And they, the trailers are, are, are amazing. And, <laughs> and, and, and the film is really good. But it's like, but when you see these trailers, your imagination goes to places sometimes I think a film can never, at least mine does, to a place a film can never go. And you're like, wow! You know, it's like I'm thinking to myself, wow, it's like this movie's good. But, but, but based upon that trailer, it's like it makes you, it looks like it's the best thing ever made, you know. So, um, but, but it is a good movie. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I, I'm looking forward to it. And um, yeah, best of luck with that and best of Thanks. luck relaxing. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. It's hard. <laughs> I don't know what to do. Uh, I'll keep my fingers crossed that your agent doesn't call you for a little while. And so you okay. don't. All right. That sense of dread. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks again, John. Right. And Thank good you. luck with all your future projects. Well, cool. I'll talk to you again, I hope, sometime. All right. So once again, thank you to John Ottman for taking some time out to hang with us. Really cool, and we're really looking forward to seeing X-Men Days of Future Past. Are you, Kevin? I am, yeah. Go see it next weekend. I think this score comes out next week on CD, right? Or yeah, where, it's uh, where now, right? Music. Um, usually YouTube. You it's usually get... the Tuesday before. Yeah, and YouTube really? doesn't even have it. So we were able to get some really good, um, uh, so not sound bites, but just some good heads up from John yeah. directly. So that was very cool. So, again, best of luck getting R&R. Because it sounds like he deserves it. (laughs) Um, So that will do it for this episode of Streamers and Punches. You can listen to us on soundnotion.tv slash SAP, where you can subscribe to our show, leave comments, and find links to the music we spoke about. You can also subscribe to the show through iTunes. My name is Bill Witham. And I'm Kevin Wilt. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next time.